Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to another Soothkeep live stream. We have our uh, dear friend Tom Hughes is on again with us here today. And brother, before we get rolling, why don't you take us before the Lord and and, and just let's give this hour to prayer. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here with everybody who's uh, joined us, and we ask for your ministering. Uh, grant all those who are, are with us right now, watching, uh, fill them with the peace that comes from your Holy Spirit, your joy, and grant Lee and myself wisdom as we just share from your word and thoughts of today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Tom here, most of you probably know him, but if you don't, He's an author of several books, including this book right here, which I am going to hold up for you guys. Get it in front of the camera, Marking the Masses. Now, this book is an excellent introduction to the subject. If you want to give a book on the mark of the beast to a young Christian or to an unsafe friend, this is an excellent option. So I just threw a plug in for you, bro. Oh, thank you, Lee. Appreciate it. You know, the, the um, you've been such a great brother and friend and colleague, too. And, uh, you know, writing, the, you know, the book. I mean, we look at everything that's coming together. And I wanted to engage the seasoned believer um, to cause, you know, the seasoned believer some more reasons to think. But I really wrote it with the intent of reaching the non-believer to, with the facts. And I put the facts out there. And hopefully, uh, people will share it with their friends. I didn't want to come across preachy or religious, but hey, here's what's out there. And guess what? Uh, at the end, you know, the, the gospel's presented at the end of the book, too. So thank you for the plug. I appreciate it. Yeah, amen. Well, we're going to go right to the program here. We're going to run for about an hour total. We're going to try and save 10, 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. And the topic today is, obviously, it's the mark of the beast. But before we get started, brother, I got a few questions I want to ask. Um, the first one is, can you just give us a quick recap of your trip to Israel that you and Brandon took? What were you oh, doing? Oh, it was, yeah, it was, it was a, just a really terrific trip. So it was different than a tour. And, um, you know, in fact, I have a tour coming up in March. It looks like it's a go. So, you know, some of your viewers are probably going to be joining me there. Crazy, uh, Lord. Yeah, it'll be exciting. But... Um, so when we were there, uh, it was a group of pastors and uh, certain leaders, and uh, we had the opportunity to go up north. We had the opportunity to go down to the Gaza area, Gaza, uh, uh, Aza, which was the one of the early kibbutz that were kibbutzim that were hit by Hamas, and it was just absolutely horrible. Uh, Starot. Now, what happened, uh, and then also, I I'll tell you, it was incredible to to see the gospel and the desire for people over there to know Jesus in a way I've never seen before Lee ever you know I've, I've gone to Israel many many times over the years I've never seen anything like this before unfortunately the backdrop is war and destruction and all the anti-semitism that's going on in the world but uh, Brandon and I we missed a couple of the things that the group got to go see because we were filming uh, we had the opportunity to meet with with uh, different people, which we had actually set up ahead of time. and um, it, But it, it was just an, a really incredible time. And I will say this because people ask, well, weren't you afraid? Well, no. I mean, Lee, you've been there. Were you ever afraid when you went to Israel, ever? I think the only time you'd be afraid if if you were in an area where there was minimal security. I mean, Israel is literally the most secure nation on earth. Well, even, even to this day, even while all these things are going on, you know, uh, you've driven through Southern California before, Lee, so you would get this. The, the scariest part was going from my house to Los Angeles International Airport, and then, and then the airport itself. That was the scariest part of the whole trip to Israel. But you land there, and even at a time of war, uh, I can honestly say I've, I felt as safe there as I have any other time I've gone, maybe a little bit safer even, which is hard to explain because I feel pretty safe there. I mean, there's so much security. And I, and I also don't think this, and, I, and I'm sure you've talked about it plenty, the war 
so far is, is localized to Gaza. Yes. Uh, now, we do understand the areas of Judea and Samaria, a.k.a. the West Bank, um, and, and there's some radicalized people within those communities. But it's localized to Gaza, and I've never taken a tour group into Gaza. You know, uh, you, you just, I mean, there's things you didn't do before, you still don't do. Uh, and, you know, the, the northern part going towards Hezbollah up in Lebanon and Syria could become problematic. Uh, we see Iran that is threatening. Um, we see what's going on with the Houthis down at the Red Sea and think of Egypt and, you know, just that whole area down there. But Israel itself is incredibly, it's incredibly safe. And, you know, Brandon and I were commenting it was, it was almost surreal because there are so few people there. You have the locals that are walking around, but you're so used to seeing tourists everywhere. But um, it, it was it was really a joy to be there. It was great to see people, and the openness of hearing about Jesus was something that's even hard to explain. But it, it was something I've never seen before. I wish people would be open to Jesus that much here in the states. Were you guys able to squeeze in a trip to Golda's or one of the other uh, ice cream shops like that? Uh, we were able to do a lot of things. <laughs> So our timing was exceptionally bad. So Brandon, he, he's going, okay, you know, because I know a lot of restaurants around there, right? Kosher and non-kosher. And, you know, you're looking for, you give me a really good hamburger or, or whatever, steaks, you know. So this is kind of funny. No, we didn't get any ice cream. Uh, what happened was there are three different restaurants. I told hey, Brandon, I'm going to take you here. You and your guys are going to love it. So we're in Tel Aviv and... I said, okay, we, we finished our filming. You know, we were both doing different filming. I said, okay, now I'm going to go to this. It's this burger place. We can get a bacon burger This in, in Israel. This place is off the charts, Brandon. And we go, and it's gone. I, I don't mean closed. It's gone. There's And this is just since a uh, year ago, October, I think was the last time I was at this place. And there's hotels brand new in business complexes in place because it's right on the, it's on the Mediterranean. Oh yeah. So I mean that is some seriously expensive property. So I guess whoever owned the burger joint decided I'll sell out to this hotel. So yeah. it's it's literally gone and uh and then there were uh, two different steak places, right? I, I said okay, Brandon, I'm going to take you to this great steak place. Uh, I call for reservations uh no, we're closed Monday, uh, Sundays and Mondays. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, because those were the two nights we had available. All right, we're going to this other place. We're online. We get reservations at this other place for steak, which also happens to have bacon and everything. But a fantastic dinner, a place called Zuni up near Ben Yehuda area. It's totally cool. Get reservations online. We show up. They're closed. They didn't tell <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they weren't out, of, but they're not out of business. They were just, uh, they they were closed. I think it was, uh, I think it was Monday night we tried Zuni, and and uh, so, anyways, it was a bummer. Every place we were going intentionally, ice cream or whatever, as our timing was really bad. Well, what do you think's going on with Pakistan and Iran, and how might that influence the broader picture? Uh, <laughs> you probably have a lot of thoughts on that. So I just finished. I've. Uh, was recording his channel with Don Perkins, which will air at about 6 p.m. Pacific time, so just here in a few hours on his channel. And we didn't even have time to get into it. There's so much more to talk about. So when I look at that, I was looking at it before we went on air there or before we recorded. And I, I tell you, man, things are heating up. I personally, um, Leo, I, I want to caution this. I don't believe we are going into World War III yet. Yeah, um, I don't either. And things could escalate, but I just don't think so. I because the way I see the book of Revelation unfolding, we have a white horse, and 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 you can from the way I read the four horsemen, and I, you know, I'm curious your thoughts on this. You know, we've talked about it a little bit before, but I see them unfolding in order. Yes, um, white horse, and then the red horse, and then the black horse, and the pale horse, because they build. By the yeah. time you get to the pale horse, you have death from the red horse war, death from the black horse, which famine, economic catastrophe, 
and then the pale horse, you have death by sword, uh, the things that follow war, economic catastrophe, and pestilence. So they, and with the white horse, you have conquering and to conquer uh, a pseudo peace yeah. uh, where there isn't war that's happening. And there's different ways that that can come about. We experienced it through the last four years of lockdowns. You could, I mean, there's different ways that conquering and to conquer uh, could take place, which I believe is rapidly approaching with between things with the World Economic Forum, World Health Organization, which Tedros, by the way, is letting everybody know you're not going to eat meat by 2025. At least that's what he wants. That's his goal. I don't know if you heard that one today or last 24 hours, but that's, you know, so these guys are trying to conquer through their rules and regulations and insanity. And the white horse could certainly fall into that. But this massive war of the red horse, I, I would, in my mind, I liken that to World War III. Yep. I don't see it happening until the writer, until Jesus says, okay, until he unseals that seal. Yep. Now, I could be wrong. This thing could blow up and it could lead to peace and security. Uh, Daniel chapter 9. Um, but I don't think we need World War III for Israel to end up entering into the Daniel chapter 9 covenant. I yep, think right. the, the Daniel chapter 9 covenant will come. It's um, uh, And it's likely going to come before um, the, the rider on the red horse. Now, again, everybody, I'm not saying this thing won't blow up and get uglier and uglier. I just don't think it's going to develop into World War III now. They're, the United States is still too powerful at this point. Yep. As woke as the military is, and as many problems as the military has with not having enough troops, and you know, there's threats from Russia, there's threats from China. And 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 I know I get I get people tell me all the time Russia's gonna invade the US or China is. I don't see that happening. At this point in the game, the United States is still too powerful as of uh today, whatever today's date is here we're january 20 what year is this 2024 yeah <laughs> so I, I but things are escalating there's no doubt about it we got to remember there's rumors of war too and not just wars but rumors of war so we're seeing wars but also rumors of war and iran and pakistan thing wow could you imagine everybody if this does go nuclear i know lee if we started saying hey this is going nuclear in 24 hours your views would go off the charts for this program. Maybe but, we should do that anyway. Well, well, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, you, you look at it. I know we, there's certain things we can say, but, yeah, you know, I just, uh, and, you know, maybe it will. You know, maybe it will, but I, I, I don't see it. I think until the Lord says, okay, now, I just, I don't see it getting to that escalation yet, although the threat, I will say this, the threat is definitely there. Pakistan yep. has nukes, the threat is definitely there. It does seem like a lot of posturing to me. They're both intentionally aiming at militant camps on each other's near border areas. And oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it was Iran that's boasting about taking out a Mossad headquarter the other day. Yep. Yeah. So we, we, there, there's, there's no doubt things are escalating. We know the whole situation with the Houthis and the Red Sea. We've been following that. We have the threat of uh, the Suez Canal being completely shut down. That would upset. That would cause some serious problems. So, folks, there's no doubt there's threats out there. I just would caution people of saying, this is it. And, yeah. um, and, and, and that's something you and I think, Lee, we've always done. We've cautioned yeah. people on saying, this is it. And then three weeks later... We move on. It didn't happen, and nobody readdresses that and says, "Well, I said this, and I was wrong." Well, well, no. You got to be really careful, and I just prefer to be careful and stick to what we do know, and say, "Hey, the possibilities are there, but I don't see it yet." Yeah, it's it's a good thing I think to look at the two, three, four potential scenarios that might come up in the future on any given circumstance. But once we settle on one says, this is it, this is going to happen. And therefore such and such is going to follow in its footsteps. We've got like four decades of recent prophetic history where we've been as a body of, of teachers have just continually missed the mark, you know, making our prognostications yeah. about the nearness of the rapture or some big war starting. And we're 99% of the time, we're just, 
we're we're going the right general direction, but we missed the mark. Well, it's something we need to be careful of. You and I talked a lot about this over the last several months, but I, you know, <laughs> you, I think you did a similar thing. When it comes to the rapture, there were a lot of people, a lot of them. We're not singling out anybody, but we go back to September, October of 2023. Yeah, there are a lot of people saying the rapture. They're basically saying the rapture is going to happen, and then um, get ready. And you know, I know I I said, hey, we better back off this thing, and you did too. And boy, we both got blasted by people all over comments. People stopped following us anymore, saying we're heretics. How could you not see the rapture's coming in September or October or whatever it was? And I asked people, hey, please, if we are still here come December, come January 1st, will you please send me an apology for tell, calling me all the mean names you called me on social media? I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of people just firing away. I didn't get any apologies. <laughs> Did you? No apologies. I was like, all right, whatever. Just we'll just keep moving on. I prefer to be as accurate and as truthful as possible. And um, you know, so that's what we do. No, I, I on that particular scenario, I received more nasty social media comments and email uh comments uh, on just the few videos that I did on that subject. That more nastiness there than all the rest of my videos put together. Yeah, and, it is pretty interesting, isn't it? But I did, though. I did get a few emails from people that apologized and and said that they had Praise they'd the gotten carried up in that, and and they and I was I was very thankful, and they were thankful that that folks like yourself had the boldness to come out and and just say, you know, I think we're getting carried away here. We we all want the Lord to come soon, but we're getting carried away. Praise, praise the Lord. And, you know, um, so, uh, but back to, I, I don't know how we got here, Lee, because I remember talking about Israel. Israel was great. Oh, I know you asked me about Iran and Pakistan and, yep. and where that was going. Okay. Now I, well, okay, let's move now. on to the mark of the beast. Okay. Few subjects have caused more speculation and more fears than the mark of the beast. In fact, sometimes as I deal with professing Christians in the world around me, it seems like they're more afraid of the mark of the beast than they are eternal hellfire. Why do you think this is? Uh, probably, probably because movies have been made about it, and they don't understand the end. Yeah, what they um, they don't understand. Listen, your end is eternal separation from God, which is eternal judgment, which the Bible describes as hell. Hmm. I'd be much more concerned about that. And with the, the believer, is look. I, you don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. You know, I had a guest on the other day, a very good friend of mine, friend of yours too, and we have a different view. I'm pre-trib rapture, he's pre-wrath. And in the program, I said, are you going to, so you believe you're going to be here to see Antichrist? He said, yes. And I said, well, I don't. So, um, and you guys can go back and watch that program from the other day. But it was, we had a wonderful dialogue. No yelling, no screaming, no calling of names. We just have a different belief system. I believe we're going to be raptured before the seven-year tribulation begins. I don't believe we are going to be confronted with the need to take the mark of the beast. But the reason I wrote the book is to alert people. Amen. Because we, the reason we do Bible prophecy is to alert people. Some people are going to be saved by the things we talk about. Lee, Bible prophecy was probably the most influential thing in my life that brought me to a saving faith in Christ. It was uh, it was explaining things from the scripture. I'd hear about them, and this is this is way back in the '80s, and you can see things connecting. Yeah. Right. And I said, well, I want to be on the right side of these. So then I learned about the first coming of Christ and got saved. But that's what we do. We we warn people. John the Baptist he warned people. He warned the common people, but he also gave very stern warnings to the the religious leaders. Hey, guess reserved for you as hellfire. And uh, he warned them of judgment, but in that, he was able to lead them to God's mercy. And and ultimately, that's that's what we do. So with the mark of the beast, what I wanted to do was help people connect the dots. I bring up, there's a lot of information in there. It's it's going to be it's something that's really hard to argue against, um, but it will cause people to think, hey, this stuff really is happening. 
Yes. Just like it says, and the Bible actually tells us this. So, but but we need to warn people. Lee, I believe that there's people that we talk about Bible prophecy to now yep. that don't really want to hear it. But guess what? During the tribulation, after the rapture, they're going to end up being saved. They're going to be part of the group of Revelation chapter 7 out of every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. They're, they get saved. And, and that's why we need to be faithful to tell them about Jesus' first coming and warn them about Jesus' second coming. Yep. 24 hours after the rapture, your neighbors are going to be ransacking your house looking for your rapture kits and for your books like Mark, yeah. <laughs> marking the masses. They, they are. You know what? For anybody that's a prepper, I say, hey, along with the beans and the rice, you know, because people are, your neighbors are going to break into your house to steal everything they can. Don't worry about your dog. They'll take care of your dog because people are so pet, you know, worried about pets. They'll take care of the dog. They're going to take your beans, your rice, and you you get things like the Rapture Kit or even this book. You know, I, I yeah. believe this book is going to be very helpful <clears throat> and instrumental to help people walk through what's going on and even why things are happening. Now, here's a, a question that perplexes a lot of people. Is the mark of the beast already being given to human beings right now in the world? No, it's not. Okay, now, and what passages in the Bible would you turn people to to try and demonstrate that this can't, no matter how bad or evil this thing is, it can't be the mark of the beast? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll say this. What is happening now, I think this is where the confusion comes, the conditioning for the mark of the beast, no doubt, it is here. It's arrived on our doorstep. People are conditioned. It's happened over the long haul. I mean, you're old enough. You remember back, it was your social security number. Yep. And then it was your ATM card. And then it was, you know, whatever it is, right? All these different ways of identifying people. Um, it, it's the barcode. Uh, yep. wh whatever it is, right? These things are all the mark of the beast. And then obviously... Um, we're on YouTube, correct? Yes, we are. Okay. So obviously certain events over the last few years have caused people to say, wait a minute. Um, this is getting a little too close to home. Listen, in what's happened over the last few years, people have been conditioned to place something. Uh, we have bodies. Exactly. I'm going to be careful here. We have bodies and and people have gotten used to the last few years of saying, oh, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm not going to be able to go to a restaurant. I'm not going to be able to go to a store. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do that unless I receive this particular thing. Therefore, I will receive it. So there's been an identification process that's happened. Yeah. There, there's a, a, a conditioning process. Uh, even churches, right? Uh, the majority of churches closed during the, the last, you know, we know that event, right? They closed. The majority of them did. Many of them remained closed. So what was eliminated, people say, well, I still have freedom of speech. Do you really? Church is closed. Yeah. Um, I still have this freedom or that freedom. Do you really? So you start looking, people were willing to surrender their freedoms to be able to buy and sell. That's right. And in many and, small towns here in, in across America, they lost most, if not all, of their little restaurants. Yes, exactly. Where I live, I, I live in a small, uh, you would consider it a small town from in the perspective of current world. You know, it's yeah. not like 300 people, but it's it's a little bit different than much of California. It's, it's primarily conservative, except for the people from Los Angeles that have been invading. <laughs> but it's been fairly conservative, and it's got a very small town feel something you would experience in the Midwest. Um, and there was one restaurant out here that stayed open, probably a couple of them that stayed open, but one in particular, the lady, friend of ours, very bold. Uh, she told the health department to pack sand a few times. And, um, <laughs> and it was one of the few places you could still go, right? Other places they would require, well, do you have this particular identification to prove that you got the, you know, whoop, whoop. Yeah. Um, and, and, so we've been conditioned for it, and people willingly. Are it reminds me of. It reminds me of Pavlov's experiment with the dogs, and 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 then the experiments that followed in that train. If you want to eat, you do this. If if you want to get a treat, you do this. They're training society. That's exactly what is happening. Everybody is being trained 
uh, by what it, by by what they're doing. So when so with that, so what happens is when it comes to the, the literal mark of the beast that's happening is no one will be able to buy or sell Revelation chapter 13 unless they receive the mark of the beast and worship him. So it's a deliberate action. Anybody yep. can look it up. It's a deliberate action to worship and bow to the beast. So there's certain things we don't have yet. Uh, also, what needs to be in place by then, according to the Bible. So the Bible is our guideline in this. So when people say, I saw this in a Hollywood movie, listen, the Hollywood movie will have some things out of the Bible in it, and the rest of it is going to be all drama and, and things like that. Uh, same thing with books. You have to stick to books that stick to the Word of God. So Amen. there are certain things that have to take place before the mark of the beast. There has to be a ten kingdom, the, this ten kingdom system with ten kings. Um, we can see it developing right now. There's going to be a global system. I, I think all of our viewers will say, oh, there's definitely an attempt at a global system right now. There right. is no doubt about it. You can see it everywhere. Okay. But according to the Bible, not only will there be a global system, there will be 10 leaders. That's not right. Not nine, not a hundred. It's going to be 10. 10 kings is what the Bible calls them. Are they oligarchs? Are they technocrats? Quite possibly. Are they presidents? And I tend to lean towards these 10 global authorities, technocrats, but you know, that's open to interpretation and speculation. But there will be 10. And it will be clear there's going to be 10. We're not there yet. That's and right. then there ha you can't have a mark of the beast without a beast. That's we right. don't have the Antichrist yet. According to both Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 17, the 10 kings have to be in place before Antichrist receives his power. So right now, people will say, well, I know who Antichrist is, and he's already running this thing. Well, maybe, listen, it is possible there is this very nefarious person that's behind the scene right now that is actually calling the shots. That is totally possible. But the 10 kings need to come in place first publicly. Publicly, they need to be exposed for who they are, and then they give their power and authority to Antichrist. And then after Antichrist, then uh, we have a false prophet, and then an image of the beast, and then, hey, the command to, you cannot buy or sell unless you receive the mark and worship him. So there's certain things that have to be in place. How close are we to that? We could be exceptionally close, which I, right. think we, I think we are, because um, of all the talk of globalism, um, a global religion coming. Um, I don't think this current pope is the false prophet, but he sure acts like one. That's right. The, so uh, wokeism, I believe, is really the foundation for this religious system that's coming because the religious system that's coming with the false prophets isn't just Catholicism. It isn't just right. Catholic. It isn't just Islam, as people say. It isn't just Protestant uh, thinking. It isn't just atheism. It's all-encompassing, and wokeism is molding people. So the conditioning for the financial and the mark of the beast the technology for the mark of the beast so you can't buy or sell, the wokeism that is now shaping the minds and the hearts of people because the religion has to get the heart. That's wokeism right. is doing that. So, And then you throw in the climate laws. There's a, there, there is the tool, the climate laws, to enforce, hey, the worship of, uh, the, the, the lifting up of um, creation, which is Romans chapter 1, the worship the creation rather than the creator. So all of the conditioning, everything is currently there. It's just a, a matter of time before it all comes into place. And I believe it's after the rapture, all of these things will fall like dominoes. You know, I heard a, a, a talk one time by Carl Teichrib that really laid this out for me, that when you look at what's coming together for the one world religion, it really is a religion. And, and they're going to have their own salvation. That salvation is if you save the planet, you'll save mankind. Yeah, I totally so they have believe salvation. It. And yeah. the Savior is going to be this Antichrist figure who's going to bring the whole world into getting in line with this program. And, and they have an enemy. The enemy 
is those that take the Bible literally and believe in Jehovah God and believe in this Jesus. That's the enemy. So they, everything gets flipped. It's a real religion. No, I, I totally believe it. So just because we don't call wokeism a religion doesn't make it a religion. Yep. The, the majority of people that are being manipulated right now by wokeism is uh, the, it's, it's, uh, the millennial age group. Yep. And they make up the majority of the population across the planet. So when you start looking at what's being taught in school, so wokeism isn't just gender. Yeah. Wokeism is gender. So the, the LGBTQ movement is far beyond what people thought it was 10 or 15 years ago in the church. That's Way right. more than that. It is spiritual at its core. And when we, uh, we, look, at, um, we look at that, also wokeism, it involves, uh, uh, the, it involves all the climate laws. Yeah, all these. It's it's a the book of Isaiah. Right will be wrong. Wrong will be right. That is what wokeism does. It's flipping everything on its head. Climate laws, um, gender stuff, and then the social justice. So we have the SJW social justice warriors. All it, it, all these things are included in wokeism. And just because we don't call it a religion doesn't mean it isn't a religion. It is a religion in and of itself. What I also find interesting here, Lee, is in Revelation chapter 17, what happens when the 10 kings get the get their power? Uh, you, you look at the, the woman who rides the beast, the harlot. So what happens? Well, guess what? They, In fact, I should read the passage. Let me see if I can find it here real quick. Yeah. Because it really puts everything together for us when we read uh, what it says here, Revelation chapter 17. Uh, I'm going to have to turn to it. Couldn't find it there. I know it's here. Hang with me, everybody. We're almost there. I promise. Here it is. What are they going to do? They are going to, oh, it's in here. It's where they burn her with fire. What do they do, yep. Lee? Here it is. They, they, um, they hate uh, her. They, yeah. We're, I'm trying to think of what verse it is. I have it in here. Oh, here's the mind of blah, 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 blah. I can't. I for some reason my my eyeballs are going it's right verse over. It. Which verse? Sixteen. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked, eat her with flesh and burn her with fire. So we have this the harlot that John is writing about is this last day's religious system that the ten kings they use the religious system, but yep. they hate her. They hate her and they burn. Her, they eliminate her. I guarantee you, all these globalists that are at the very top, they're, they're not stupid. These guys are some of the, listen, Bill Gates is not stupid. He's a brilliant man by man's standards, but he's evil. That's right. So you have these people at the top. I'll guarantee you, Klaus Schwab is not a stupid man. Nope. I'll guarantee you, he's a very smart man, but he's evil. So what they, these people can't possibly believe the climate laws are real. The climate things are enforcing. No, what they're real is control. They know there's only two genders. Yeah. They know there's a male and there's a female. They know that the social justice warriors is just total nonsense, but they also know what the Nazis were able to do, the communists throughout the history of the world were able to do, the Roman Empire and all these other war empires of the past. They got to get control. So what do they do? They use this wokeism, I believe, to gain their power. Amen. Mess with people's minds, brainwash them. Once they get their power, they completely eliminate them. That's what communists do. Once they come into power, they eliminate the very people who supported them, well, because they know they're idiots, and they know that the stuff isn't real. Yep. It's total lie. They know it's a lie, hence they burn her with fire. But Will wokeism be part of the Catholic Church? I think it already is at, at its at its top levels. Uh, it's just I, I a matter not... of time before it trickles down out of the College of Cardinals and into the bishops and into absolutely, the whole absolutely. We we already see what's happening to the bishops are standing up against the Pope and the Vatican yep. and saying this is evil. Right? They're being eliminated. Uh, Carlo Vignano, who's been calling out the Pope, saying he's an antichrist or false prophet, they eliminate them. But this Pope is pushing it. You have the people at the top of the Vatican. They are pushing the wokeness, uh, all their gender ideology, the climate laws, 
And it's not just this pope. This has been going on for a long time. 1963, the pope back then was yep. saying the exact same things about the pope now. And, and for those who think Benedict before this pope was wonderful, he said the exact same things when he was pope that this current pope said in his encyclical back in 2015. So it's all, not all new. It's all this has been processing and conditioning, and here we are in the, the year 2024, and things are coming together. So when is the mark going to be rolled out? I believe it's rolled out in the middle of the tribulation period. That's uh, right. How Lindsay believes in the beginning, I believe in the middle. I, I believe it, it happens uh, when Antichrist uh, presents himself as being the one to be worshipped. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's all this process that leads up to that. So uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 13, as you follow, you have the trumpet judgments. You have all of the events of Revelation chapter 13 that take place. Um, I, I just don't see it being implemented until the midpoint of the tribulation period. And the first three and a half years, Mr. Fix-It, Antichrist, he's, he's going to appear to fix the world problems that his boss, Satan, uh, made sure that the Bill Gateses of the world and uh, all these other woke people uh, made sure that they destroyed everything. He's going to come along and say, I have answers. These guys messed it all up. I'm here. I've got the solution. I believe, Lee, this might sound wild, but what's happening now with the insanity of these globalists, most people are resistant to it. They're going, yep. this stuff doesn't make any sense. I don't want to eat bugs. I want to eat steak. I want to eat hamburgers. Even vegetarians can say, I don't want to eat bugs, you know? So yeah. people don't want to eat bugs. They see the, it's not just bugs. It's, it's virtually everything. We see it's happening with EV cars in the freezing cold area. I'm sure it's been kind of cold where you live. And, um, uh, but so we see, it, so they're going, wait, this stuff isn't working. Antichrist and the economic policies are going to bring the collapse of Revelation chapter six with the black horse. These things, what perfect setup by Satan. That's Satan right. has to make his man look like the Messiah, the savior to a world that's collapsing. Perfect. Use the globalists and the and the stupidity of the the these global leaders thinking they are wise and uh, bringing about these policies to destroy everything. They'll destroy everything. Antichrist, I believe, is going to come along and say, I've got the solution. And ultimately, as the world is being fixed, peace is coming, he's going to come along and say, hey, uh, we've got to implement this mark of the beast in order to have genuine unity, bring in our utopian world, and I'm the Messiah. And I believe he presents himself as the Messiah at the three-and-a-half-year period, which is where the Jews recognize they've been deceived in Jerusalem with this covenant that's been confirmed. And Jesus tells them there in Matthew 24, flee. If you're in Judea, flee. If it's on the Sabbath, pray you don't have to escape on the Sabbath, but you've got to flee. And we can count the number of days. So we know it's a three and a half year period, the second yep. half of the tribulation period. So what will be the consequences for those that refuse to take the mark? You won't be able to buy or sell. So when you, and also you'll, you're going to get your head chopped up if you're caught. So it's going to be, a, so all these people who talk about tolerance, oh, we're totally tolerant as long as you do this, right? Yeah. That's, which we hear now, we're tolerant as long as you don't talk about Jesus. Well, then it's going to be tolerant as long as you worship this person, right? It reminds um, me of when Henry Ford first rolled out his first line of vehicles. You can have this car in any color you want, as long as it's black. There, there you go. It's just like that. Listen, and, and you know, it, it will be sold that way, won't it? Yep. You can have all the freedom is your choice. You have freedom to eat anywhere you want. You have feed, freedom to travel, freedom to have a big house, freedom to have a bank account, freedom to whatever it is. You have all this freedom as long as you receive the mark of the beast and you worship him. That's all you got to do. So without it, what I don't think people understand is you think, well, I'm just going to um, grow my own vegetables. No, you aren't going to be able to. Guess what? You aren't going to have water. Well, I have my own well. Okay, well, guess what? Why do we have all of these laws coming, uh, environmental laws, where you aren't going to have well water anymore? They are out. Listen, the feds are out to take away your well water. 
well, I'll catch rainwater. Why do you think there are laws that are coming against people even storing rainwater? People are doing it, and they'll get away with it. There are some people who will find a way around the system because, and they're going to come to Christ. They're going to populate the planet during the millennial kingdom. But overall, you won't be able to pay your property tax bill. You yep. won't be able to pay your rent. You won't be able to buy or sell. You aren't going to have any money. Uh, this is why people are sounding the alarm on digital currency. There are those who don't believe in Bible prophecy that are sounding the alarm on digital currency because they recognize they can shut you off at any time. Same reason with electric vehicles and so forth. They can shut you down and they can control you. We in the Bible prophecy world say, not only can they shut you down and control you, the Bible even says this is what's coming. So that's why we in the prophecy world sound the alarm about digital currency. You can't buy or sell digital currency. CBDCs are the perfect um, weapon to be leveraged against people, to be able to completely control them. And so both the secular world, unsaved, not even talking about the Bible, they see the same things we see. We just see where the Bible says, hey, this is going to happen. You better turn to Christ because this is going to come. So what's going to be the eternal fate of those who do take the mark? Uh, Revelation chapter 14 says all those who receive the mark uh, and worship him will have their part in the lake of fire. There's something that happens, apparently, when a person receives the mark of the beast. Again, it's clear. It's an act of worship. Yep. Um, you won't be able to buy or sell unless you receive the mark and worship him. They're combined. People try to separate those because Revelation 14 says all those who receive the mark doesn't say anything about worship him at that point. Yep. Um, but they're combined. And I think people try to make the separation and say, well, you can receive the mark and not worship the beast. Not according to Revelation 13. That's it right. is combined. You have to do both in order to buy or sell. So accordingly, Revelation 14 there is an angel that warns every single person on the planet. Nobody will have excuse. Do not receive the mark of the beast nor worship him or um, or you will not be able to, uh, you'll, you'll have your place in judgment with uh, the Antichrist and false prophet. You, there, there's no turning back at that point. I've often thought of it that it's not, it's some people say, well, so you're going to go to hell just for having this exterior thing. Well, no, it's beyond ha merely having an exterior mark. The, the, yeah. There's a degree of unbelief that's something. involved here where yeah. you've got a Titanic struggle between the powers of darkness and, and the testimony of God uh, on earth. And by the time the dust settles, Nobody is going to be neutral sitting on the fence. Nobody's going to accidentally take that mark. To take that mark, you have to reject the testimony of the 144,000. You have to reject the testimony of the two witnesses. You have to reject the testimony of the angels flying in heaven. You have to reject the testimony of every spirit-filled believer on the planet. Nobody is going to ignorantly go there. They know the score, and they're going to go the wrong way anyway. Yep. And, and the, the exact verse is Revelation chapter uh, 14 is verse 9 says this, Then a third angel followed the other angels, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So it's, there is very clear. And prior to this, <clears throat> you have the other two angels that are going out warning everybody on the planet, the one proclaiming the goodness of God and proclaiming the gospel, you must receive Christ. And That's right. uh, no, like you said, no one's going to be without excuse. As, uh, God leaves, there's no neutral in this. It's either you, then now there is the speculation, especially as we've seen events take place lately. We hear more and more about technology, the altering of DNA, uh, Neuralink, all these different things going on. Could something that uh, take place when a person receives the mark of the beast that alters their DNA. Um, 
that's open to discussion, no doubt yeah. about it. And we do know that with all those who receive the mark of the beast also are going to have these horrible sores that are going to break out on their, on their body, which also leads people to believe, well, wait a minute, something happens when you receive this. So hence, the last four years and the things that everybody was told that they had to do yeah. to be a good, it was to be a good citizen, wasn't it? It yep. still is. You look at that, uh, what's his name for Kansas City Chiefs, uh, Travis Kelsey, on there with all the commercials touting a certain procedure to take and how wonderful it is. If you're a good citizen, he and Taylor Swift will be your buddies or whatever, you know. It's it's that, right? It's, it's still proclaiming if you're a good citizen. So the conditioning is there. We think of the mark of the beast. If you're a good citizen, you're going to get this thing that's still coming in the future, but something happens with this, apparently, definitely spiritual. There's no doubt there's a spirit. Number one is a spiritual dynamic, but could there be a physical dynamic also connected with it? Probably, probably way before COVID. You know, we uh, both, we have friends and colleagues that speculated something physical happens when a person takes the mark of the beast. And now we look back last four years and we go, it could definitely have i believe it there is it's it, i think it's both both yeah. things are happening i used to be pretty skeptical of the physiological changes in the mark of the beast and was looking at it mostly as a tracking mechanism and and uh identification mechanism but when you look at some of the stuff that's been uh experimented with and the directions mm -hmm. they're trying to take this technology and how they they're very definitely interested in a transhuman approach to the future oh, if you're not totally. considering this as part of the package whether it's part of the mark or it's something that you can only have access to if you get the mark you need to be considering this oh absolutely in fact it's in chapter 16 of revelation when we have the bold judgments it says mm -hmm. so the first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. So it's very specific. You got this thing, baby, guess what? So the warnings are there. I love how you said it. There's not a neutral place. That's right. Why don't Christians have to worry about the mark of the beast? Um, I believe that we are going to be raptured before the mark of the Amen. beast is, is, is here. Um, I, I look and I've heard the other arguments, uh, against the pre-tribulation rapture. To me, I'm looking at the Bible going, it's pretty clear we're going to be raptured before the tribulation comes. I, I'm steadfast in looking at the Bible and thinking, all right, there is the the final, the 70th week of Daniel, the final seven-year period, it's about the Jews. That's right. God is turning the attention of the Jews to him. We see this right now in Israel. Uh, we can see it, Lee. I mean, there's an aliyah going. There's more people coming to Israel right now. God's, I mean, you can totally look at world events and go, God is zeroing in on Israel. And we know Jerusalem's going to become the focal point. Why? Because God is moving his prophetic calendar forward. So the 70th week of Daniel is the 70th week of Daniel. The first 69 weeks were all about the Jews. In my mind, what on earth makes a Gentile think the 70th week is about them? It, it's not about them. It wasn't about them in the past. Why would God change that? And when you look at how the, the prophecies, how they unfold and the, the lessons that are told, even all of the discourse, it is about the Jewish people. That's right. Gentiles are included in the world, just as they were in ancient Israel's past. But God is turning his attention to Israel, and he turns it to Israel. We can see it turning now, which makes me think, folks, you better be ready. That's we right. can see it turning now, but uh, that's the primary reason. The 70th week of Daniel is the seven-year period focusing in on the nation of Israel. Romans chapter 11, uh, don't be ignorant of this mystery lest you be puffed up in your own opinion. God is not done with Israel. Uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. That's right. Uh, you know, and, and then all Israel will be safe. So we see this. There's there's a fullness of the Gentile era. People say that's at the end of the tribulation period. 
Um, however you want to work that out. But ultimately, uh, you know, I would argue that point. But ultimately, um, God says, listen, don't be puffed up. Don't be thinking you're smarter than everybody else and mocking those who believe in God's prophetic That's right. uh, prophetic scriptures regarding second coming of Christ. Uh, Lee, I watched a video yesterday by a very, very well-known per- person. Somebody, I, I can mention it, most people know who he is. Um, he's on the right, very conservative, just mocked. Uh, didn't mention me or you by name. I don't know if he even knows us. But he mocked anybody who believes in the rapture. And it surprised me because I never heard this angle coming from him before. He said the teaching on the rapture is straight out of the pit of hell. And then he went on, and then it became very clear, he's dominionism. We're going to fix this world. You know, he, right. he based his, his thinking on the Bible. And, uh, and I was sitting there going, wow, you've got this, this whole thing wrong. And he thinks we're of the devil for teaching something like the rapture. When clearly, how do you explain away 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where there's the catching up? How do you explain away 1 Corinthians chapter 15? I know how they explain it away. This yeah. is what they say. Well, it says that, but it doesn't really mean that. That's what they say. Well, I say it says that, and God means what he says. And to me, it's also interesting. How do you see in the scriptures the church Christianizing the world and seeing a significant percentage born again, when in the scriptures we see the Antichrist spirit, um, the mystery of iniquity, Satanizing the world. That's how, that. That's what the uh, world ends with. Yeah. Well, who now? Who in their right mind could possibly think? Go back to the time of Adam and Eve. Yeah. That. Okay, we're going to fix the world. Okay, don't even go back to Adam and Eve. Let's just go back to the ascension of Christ and Pentecost, yep. and we have the birth of the church. <clears throat> Has this world gotten better? Is it more glorious? Is it more Christ-like? Is it more Christian than it's ever been before? Are we going towards goodness and holiness and righteousness and awesomeness? No, we are on the verge of absolutely eliminating everybody on the globe. When That's you right. look at wars and rumors of wars, when we look at the LGBTQ stuff, we look at the insanity of the climate laws, we start looking at everything, you're thinking, it's better? No. The teaching that is getting better are these globalists, we've got this utopian mindset. We're going to fix the world. Which, by the way, leads to many pastors and pulpits that also mock us that line themselves up with the World Economic Forum, That's right. with the World Health Organization with the CDC, with the UN. They line themselves up with it because in their mindset, the rapture teaching is foolishness. Those who pay attention to the book of Revelation and say, look, these things are coming about, um, it, because they've looked at this teaching as being foolishness, they're going along. They've linked themselves with the Pope. They've linked themselves with Klaus Schwab They'll because they're going to fix the world. I prefer to link myself with Jesus and link myself with the Bible. That may sound simplistic, but how can someone explain all of the events of the Bible prophetically that just happen to be coming together right now in the age that we live in? Is it just coincidence? No, these weren't just made up by Lee and Tom in the last three years. You can go back and you can look at people who are looking at the prophetic scriptures from decades ago and even centuries ago and even go all the way back to hundreds of years ago where people would say, wait a minute, I believe the Bible's literal regarding prophecy, therefore Israel's going to be nation again. They're going to be gathered back again. There's going to be a beast, a.k.a. Antichrist. There's going to be a mark of the beast. Wait a minute, Russia and Iran are going to line up, and they're going to come against Israel. Uh, No, we didn't just make this up in the last few years because it's convenient. That's right. That's so right. So we look at it and go, no, this has been this has been here. I it was it was Bible prophecy that sparked me to coming to faith in Christ, which I said that in the beginning. That was uh, thirty some years ago. Yeah, and, and for and, me, and, and, go ahead. I was just going to say, and for me, I didn't come to Christ through Bible prophecy, but once I got in the Bible, Bible prophecy gripped me. I it's like grabbing an electric wire, and it grabs you, and you can't let go. Once I got into the prophetic message of the Bible, 
there was, I, that was it. I was hooked. Yeah. yeah, I was too. And and this is before CBDC or any of those things. But now we can see mm-hmm. everything unfolding with the illumination as Daniel chapter 11 uh, yep. uh, describes as the understanding of the Bible is going to come to be. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, the the foolish will see it and they won't understand. But the, Daniel says, but the wise will see it and they will understand. They're going to get it. They're going to connect. Mm-hmm. But those who reject these things as being uh, literal will see what's going on. They're going to they're going to poo poo it. They're going to mock Second uh, Peter chapter three. They're going to mock and scoff at us. So that's happening. Another fulfillment of prophecy in and of itself. There. Well, we're going just a little longer than I'd anticipated. I still want to get to a few Q and A if we can. Okay, please. But, yeah, please, please. Sorry about that. No, no worries. But I wanted to hear um, you, the story about your father in in uh, Beverly Hills. Okay, so uh, so uh, my dad, it was 1961. My dad worked for a company called Teledyne. And um, and the reason he worked for this company, it was a, it was a tech company, uh, what we would call a startup company, right? Startup mm-hmm. tech company. And the uh, my dad went to school, he went to college, he got his master's in chemistry. And uh, this is what led to him having this position at Teledyne as a metallurgist. And they're a small company, five people there, my dad being one of them. Uh, and then there were other uh, companies, small at the time too, Intel and, and uh, different companies. But uh, my dad was invited to, the, the, the head of Teledyne at the time was someone named Henry Singleton. Do a Google search on Henry Singleton. You're going to find out who he was. And uh, it's going to kind of blow your mind. But what we have today is because of these men that uh, my dad got to know. So my dad's working at this company. He's invited to a party in Beverly Hills. um, And you had, again, these are all small companies at the time. And uh, and Arthur Rock uh, was one of the individuals. Claude T. Shannon, uh, the father of information theory, Um, Gordon Moore, Moore's Law regarding technology and the transistor. He was there, uh, Henry Singleton. It's all these guys. This was the beginning of what would become Silicon Valley. Now, this is in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, 1961. My dad's at the party with these guys. It was just a work party. Um, And so uh, one of the guys comes up. My dad's looking at, you know, the Los Angeles basin below. You've seen it before, Lee. You got all the lights down there, you're in Beverly Hills, beautiful homes, looking down and he's with this group of these other just geniuses. And uh, this one of the guys comes up to him and he says, you see that, Jim? He goes, one day we're going to control all these people. And my dad said he knew he wasn't talking about just Los Angeles. It kind of, you know, we would use the term creeped out my dad at the time. Yeah. My dad wouldn't use that word. My dad's still alive. He's 93. But uh he said um, uh, he knew that he wasn't just talking about Los Angeles. They're talking about the, the globe, controlling the globe with technology. Then shortly after that, my, um, my dad was offered to move up to San Jose uh, to the area that would become the Silicon Valley. And it, the whole Silicon chip, you know, sand and all that. That's where all this came from. So he was there in the beginning stages of it. My mom told my dad, we're not moving up there uh, to do that and so forth. So my mom talked my dad out of it. He didn't. He stayed in Los Angeles. And, you know, my life would be completely different had I been raised in uh, in Silicon Valley in that environment. But um, that's, that's essentially what it was. I recorded a conversation that I had with my dad a few couple years, two, three years ago that led to, that led to this book, by the way. It was yeah. that conversation – and then I met with the publisher and I said, hey, you know, with all the things that we talk about, I think uh, I should write a book. You might be interested. Listen to this conversation I recorded. So the conversation itself is not for, uh, it's private. You know, I've never, you know, played that and I don't have any intention to ever play that. It was a 30 minute conversation as my dad just recalled all these different events. He since then recalls more, you know, so I was picking yep. his brain and uh, more and more, uh, of those things. But, um, so, uh, that's basically 
that's basically it. So what was that, 60 years ago, 63 years ago now? Yeah. And uh, you fast forward to where we are now, and, and this is this is what it is. Now we have the technocrats involved and the controlling of the masses. Something interesting my dad said to me, he said that to me this repeatedly, he goes, you know what? These were really good guys that he worked with. And for the most part, he said they didn't have these nefarious intentions. He, he believes that the whole, he goes, they were like family men and, and that they weren't into the things today. And he goes, but he believes the whole system, I mean, these would have all been really old men. Got, you know, you have other people that came in, hijacked it, and, uh, took it to where it is today. Now, granted, the one guy saying we're going to control all the people, he said not everybody had good intentions. But yeah. he said for the most part, they really thought they were doing good things for the globe with technology, I mean, he he told me about how with the chips and what's going to happen to him. 1961, these things are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and he's described it to where we are today. And they knew that they would get there, and so here we are. Well, how about if we do some rapid fire Q and A? Sure. We got maybe ten questions. If we just try and pound Get an answer, answer. Out real fast i'll do a shorter because i was going to depart three minutes ago so okay. I, I guess i set myself up with really long answers okay sorry about that no okay. worries it's been a good program would it could a trump administration be used by the lord to restrain evil yes you know i mean um you know you have the pro-trump and anti-trump within the prophecy circles our i i think uh, you know, all of us need to understand our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And it, when Jesus came the first time, the both the right and the left, Sadducees and Pharisees, were looking for a political leader to give him victory over Rome. Jesus came along offering salvation. The right and left both rejected him. He was crucified. Listen, our hope is in Jesus. But certainly God could use a Trump administration to restrain evil. Um, and uh, But ultimately... The restrainer, Second Thessalonians chapter two, I believe, is the Holy Spirit working through believers, and the rapture is what uh, eliminates the restraining force from the planet. What's going to bring Israel peace in Ezekiel thirty-eight? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so we do know there's going to be a peace covenant that's going to be confirmed, Daniel chapter nine. Yep. I believe also, Lee, you might think differently on this, but I believe also Isaiah chapter twenty-eight. Is speaking of the same covenant yep. when you have these wicked people who rule over Jerusalem, which leads me to believe it's talking about uh, Knesset. They enter into an agreement with um, the the devil, essentially, yep. death in the grave. And then that covenant is broken, and they do it to avoid a scourge that's coming against them. I have a friend. He's a history teacher, history buff, history teacher, been teaching history for a couple of decades out of the blue one time, he didn't know Isaiah 28. He said to me, he goes, you know what Islam is? It's a scourge on the earth. And I said, that's really f interesting that you use the, the word scourge because in Isaiah 28, Israel is, enters into an agreement to avoid a scourge. Hmm. And he said, listen, everywhere Islam has gone, gone, they become a scourge. They start slaughtering people and killing them. And he goes, they're a scourge. And uh, so something's going to happen that's going to cause Israel to enter into an agreement. Now, will it be the Daniel 9 covenant, Isaiah 28 covenant, that causes Israel to enter into the peace that gives them the peace of Ezekiel 38? I don't know. Ultimately, that will give them the security that of seven years. We know that from Daniel chapter 9. But it could be, I, I believe, Lee, Israel has to, for Ezekiel 38 to take place, uh, peace and security, the word for peace that's used there, I think it's in verse 11, is tranquility in yeah. the Hebrew. So although I felt very secure in Israel last week, they're not in a tranquil place. That's Everybody's right. on edge all the time they're on edge. So something has to happen that's going to enter, have Israel enter into that. And I believe the backdrop of the current events have a very good chance of leading Israel into that place to take security. Do you have enough time to say one more thing on this? Yeah, go ahead. I received a text from somebody over in Israel, which I won't, I won't mention their name, um, but they said, listen, 
um, somebody has to take control of Gaza and Israel will not do it. In other words, Israel's, what they were saying, Israel's official position will be, we will not take control over Gaza. What does that mean? They have to agree to some kind of peace force to enter into Gaza and guarantee Israel's peace. I find that interesting. Yeah, maybe forward. Egypt or Saudi Arabia. Something is going to happen yep. that's going to cause, and I think the Gaza influence, this whole thing is very influential on what is coming. Uh, why do you think there must be at least a small gap between the rapture and the 70th week? Um, I, I think the rapture will be significant enough to cause a lot of chaotic situations. If we think of it uh, with the rider on the white horse, the rider on the white horse goes about conquering and to conquer. Mm -hmm. got to, so in other words, there's got to bring some kind of security to the planet. I believe after the rapture takes place, um, there's going to be all kinds of insecurity going on. Even if and I, I don't think the numbers of people being raptured are going to be 10%. That's me, but I don't know. God God knows. But even if it's only 1% of the population, some countries are going to have a lot more than others. Yeah. Let's say it's only 1% of the population in the United States. That is still going to be very, uh, uh, it's going to have some significant negative consequences to the planet. That's right. Even the United States. Government, schools, business, everything. Um, so the rapture takes place. There's going to be a lot of chaos that's going to go on. So there's going to have to be some kind of security that, okay, we've, we've got a mess right now. We got to fix. Um, if it happens like left behind series, I don't know if it'd be as dramatic as that, but I do think it's going to be dramatic. Um, so things are, there's just going to be a lot. There's going to be a mess. Okay. China will be a mess. That's right. I hear there's more Chinese Christians than like anywhere on the planet. They're all underground. China's going to be an absolute mess. Yep. Iran will be a mess because all kinds of people in Iran are coming to faith in the Lord. So you start looking at that, you think there's going to be significant problems that need to be overcome in order for the white, house, the white horse to be able to get that control that it needs to get. Because that's what it comes in. The white horse is, is controlling. Well, brother, we probably got about a half hour of questions left. So if you need to bug out, I can just. Well, you, keep you asking more and then I'll check out. Oh, okay. Just, I'll try to answer them shorter. I don't, I don't have short enough answers, Lee. I'll, okay. I'll try. I'll try. Okay. What's the difference in the concept of wrath between the pre-wrath position and the pre-trib position? Um. That's a good question. I believe the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of the Lord begins in Revelation chapter 5 when Jesus unseals the seals. Amen. It's, it's, it begins with Jesus, right? Yep. So it doesn't, in fact, it, when you look at Revelation, and this is another hang up I have uh, with these other positions, is in Revelation chapter 5, it's clear that nobody is worthy to unseal the seals. Uh, um, this, this is going to be a kind of a three-minute answer. Is that okay? No, that's fine. So when, when I look at what's in the scroll, I believe it's a title deed to the planet. Okay. And that is what Jesus is unscrolling. You, you have similar thoughts on what's in the scroll? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was, what well, some of your viewers will be familiar with this. Before I was a pastor, I worked as what's called a title officer in a title insurance company. And what was required for a person to take title of property? Let's say, Lee, you're going to buy property from me, right? Yep. Um, you're going to buy my house from me. Well, in order for you to buy my house, the title insurance company makes sure there's no judgments, there's no liens, there's no problems that I brought on that nobody knows about. That's right. So all of the judgments, all of the liens, all of the problems that I accrued have to be rectified. That's mm. what's happening when Jesus takes title to planet Earth. All of the problems that man has caused because of sin have to be rectified. I, I have to make sure I pay off my judgments. I pay off the IRS. 
I pay off the contractor who did work. I pay off all the different mortgage. All the different mortgages are paid off because you don't want to inherit those things. That's well, right. Well, Jesus ain't. So that's what's happening. It's the title deed to planet Earth. The judgments are being revealed. That's no right. one is worthy but Jesus. So as each seal is loosed, boom, baby, planet Earth is getting a pay. It, payments due. Right. Yep, Things are right. going to be rectified. That is what is happening. So only Jesus could do that. Revelation chapter 5 is clear. Only Jesus is the one who is worthy to bring that about. So in my mind, it's pretty straightforward. Yep. Not only that, but also in Revelation chapter 5, who do we see? All those who are redeemed, who are praising the Lord as he begins. And, he, and, and they're, they're there before he even loosens the first seal. Yep, we're right. there actually watching when we're saying, who is worthy? When we hear all the voices, who is worthy to do this? We're there. Read Revelation chapter 5 for yourself, everybody. It is the redeemed of the earth, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Who's that? Yep. Well, it has to be us. So, so we have to be there. And then, and then the seals are loosed. The judgments are rectified. That's what's happening. One thing, too, people want to make a distinction between the wrath of man and the wrath of God, and they look at the Antichrist like that's man's wrath against man. But what Tom just brought out, the, the, the Antichrist, he's the first seal. That whole Antichrist spirit, the person of the Antichrist, that comes forth with that first seal. That is a judgment of God upon the world. The world rejected the true Messiah, so God's going to give them the false Messiah. And I think that's where people get screwed up. They they don't want to yeah. understand that that's judgment. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say this also with the the, the horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, all of them, I have no doubt. What's happening is God, in His sovereignty, He is using the men who think they are wise in their idiotic plans to bring about His judgment that He's determined. That's right. Uh, it, it God is sovereign in the same way. We can look at it like this. This is listen, folks. In the same way, in Revelation chapter 17, we have 10 kings who give their power and authority to the beast, right? That's okay. right. You go a few verses later, chapter 17, verse 17 says, God is the one who put it on the hearts of the 10 kings to bring about their system and point Antichrist to bring about his prophetic plan. So in that, God uses men in men's pride to bring about his judgments. And that's what I see unfolding with the, 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 the seals, the first four seals. And people say, well, wait, the trumpet and bull judgments, yeah, they unfold different, but they're all the wrath of God. That's right. That's right. Do the two prophets or the two... Um witnesses are they going to call down their judgments like lack of rain and fire only on the middle east or over the entire world i think it's on the whole world isn't it well that's uh, how i would take uh, it yeah i'm pretty sure um let's see i'm here revelation chapter 11 they have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire so I'm thinking of the earth, it, it comes from word means uh, it's dirt, basically. Yep. But uh, in context, I believe it's the whole planet. Mm -hmm. They have the power to do whatever, whatever they want to do. Hence, uh, if it wasn't the whole planet, why would the whole planet celebrate after they're dead? Right? The whole globe sees them. And the whole globe is celebrating. Listen, pe most people on earth could care less what's going on in Gaza. We care because of the Bible. Right? We that's care right. about Israel, but you talk to most people. That's that's a war over there with those people over there. That's what most people think. No, the whole globe is going to be glad that these two guys are dead. That's right. The whole globe is also going to see them rise from the grave. Here's a question going down a completely different track, but is it true that nobody can believe in Jesus for salvation unless God enables them to believe? Um, that that that. That is, I, I personally believe that it is God who drew me to the place of salvation. Yeah. I believe I had to say yes. Um, I I had to make a choice. 
but I also believe it's God who drew me. Uh, right. Jesus, Jesus himself said, no one comes to him unless the Father draws him. So how that works out, I don't know. I believe two things are evident. Um, you're chosen, but you also got to choose. You yeah. also have to make a choice. How they both work out together, I do not know. But I will say this, that question and the answer to this question has called, caused arguments since Jesus came the first time. And churches and denominations, I mean, I've had to deal with this as a pastor for a long time, but it does cause arguments. There's no doubt the Bible says, talks about being chosen. He chose yeah. you, but there's no doubt also, I have to respond. That's right. I, I like to tell people, if you understand biblical election and biblical sovereignty, the way that God wants us to understand them, then they're not going to be in contradiction with biblical presentation of the gospel with man's responsibility to repent and believe. And they they get, a, get hand in glove. They do. And if you want to get a really long answer on that, Ask Lee to explain biblical sovereignty and biblical election, and you'll be here for days. <laughs> because that's, that's the truth. There are books and books and books written on this. But I, I totally uh, spot on with you, Lee. It's like, look, we see these things. They're taught in the Bible. You can't get around certain things that the book of Ephesians says, even certain things in the book of Revelation, uh, uh, things Jesus himself said. You can't get around those things. So... Uh, I mean, you know, so, yeah, okay, let's move forward. Thank you. All right. Nobody knows for sure who the Antichrist is, but and it maybe is going to be someone under the radar, but could King Frederick X be an Antichrist candidate? You know what? Lee Brainerd could be an Antichrist candidate, but I don't think he is a realistic one, <laughs> and neither am I. Listen, you know what? I, I can guarantee if, if I did a search right now through my email, I could find – probably a hundred different people that have sent me who Antichrist is just in the last short bit of time. Right? So I, yeah, I mean, look, who could be, there's lots of people that could be, uh, Europe is full of all kinds of people. You know, I believe Antichrist comes out of a revived Roman empire, yep. uh, but we can get into details. Well, what does that mean? Roman empire encompassed diff uh, a pretty good size area. I believe it comes out of the Western leg of the Roman empire too, which still, encompasses a very large area. You really don't see the rise of the Eastern leg of the Roman Empire, the strength of it till later on. Yeah. But um, I, I, you know, I just, I don't like to speculate too much on who Antichrist is. Um, but, hey, you know what? I, I mean, is Bill Gates Antichrist? How about Barack Obama? Uh, I mean, Donald Trump. That's right. Hillary Clinton. So, okay, here's the reason why Hillary cannot be Antichrist is because Antichrist is always in the masculine. Yeah, that's right. So, unless there's a gender thing that happens in there or something but in the crazy world we live in. Since I was a babe in the Lord in the early 80s, there's been dozens of men promoted is where people write books and say, I know this man's the Antichrist and give all kinds of cool arguments why. And you'd look at the arguments and there's lots of spiritual analogies, but I think yeah. all this amounts to is that everybody that's in the world elite has a lot of spooky connections and a lot of spooky, mysterious things about them. <laughs> and those things in and of themselves do not prove that person's yeah. the Antichrist, just proves he's part of the world's elite. Proves he's spooky and part of the Luciferian yeah. abyss thing. I Partly, had... I think the Antichrist is going to come out from the shadows. He's a dark horse candidate. Nobody knows who he is. Yeah. He's being groomed in a back room. Okay, and here's something. Else. Okay, uh, two things. So I remember, remember, uh, I can't remember his first name. Hasselhoff, I think, was his last name. Knight Rider and oh, Bay. Right, right. Yep. Okay, whatever his name is. I had somebody email me, this was years ago, that he was Antichrist, and they pointed out all the reasons why. There's so much insane stuff out there. And also, here's something else to think about. He doesn't have to be a political leader. No. If we think of who the Ten Kings are, we still don't know. Are they oligarchs? Are they um, uh, technocrats? Are they kings? Are they presidents? Are they prime ministers? We don't know, but 
out of the 10 kings, according to Daniel, there's an 11th horn, a little one that comes up. But they don't have to be a politician at all. And I would even speculate at this point in the game, good chance they're not a politician. They're, they're going to be a problem solver and extremely charismatic and likable. That's right. And they're going to be liked by the right and the left. By both sides, they're going to be liked which eliminates almost everybody that comes in your email bin right now saying this person is Antichrist. Is the first recognition of the Antichrist going to be when he signs the covenant? Is that when he's first revealed? Okay, so that would be my my view on it. Yeah, That, is, that would be when, uh, for people who are paying attention, yes. I would say for people who are left behind, Yep. For people who are pre-wrath or post-wrath, post-trib, uh, they would say they'll see him do it, and yep. they'll know, right? Yep. I would say we're not going to be here to see it, but I do believe that is uh, the uh, main identifier. For the Jews living in the tribulation period, they'll have their eyes, their spiritual eyes, uh, woken up like the Apostle Paul did, Um when on the road to Damascus, when he was wakened up, um, he, his spiritual eyes, he suddenly knew who Jesus was and that he was believing wrong. That is going to happen to the Jews, I believe, when they're in the temple. As Jesus said, when they see the, when you see the abomination of desolation flee. So it, for me, that's a real marker at the midpoint of the tribulation for the Jews are going to go, that's not the guy. That's the bad guy. We now know who Jesus is, and they flee. And for people who we have told, for all of you who are watching, you've told, yep. you've warned them about the covenant. Daniel chapter 9 is the marker so that hopefully their eyes will be woken up. Uh, uh, because we also know, Lee, that there's many Gentiles that come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it appears Amen. pretty early on after the rapture that they're going to start turning to the Lord. So if that's the case, that means we've been faithful to tell them and alert them. Hey, Amen. watch out for the guy who confirms the covenant for seven years. Amen. How about people who heard the gospel before the rapture and didn't believe it? Will they get a second chance after the rapture? Okay. I believe they will. Amen. Um, not everybody believes like I believe. I think you believe they will, Lee. Yep. Um, what people who believe otherwise they base it on second Thessalonians chapter 2 um, some pretty well-known teachers um, have believed that they won't have a second chance but in second Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, the Bible says this the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So I, I've, you know, I, I know what the argument it is. It's, well, you told them the gospel now. They didn't receive Christ before the rapture. Therefore, they would not receive the love of the truth, which is, uh, what it says here that they might be saved, verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Therefore, God's going to send the ones who rejected Christ now um, to hell. They're going to they're gonna believe the lie. So if if I believe that, you know what I would do, Lee, right now? Hmm. I would stop telling people anybody about Jesus. Amen, yeah. Because I would not want them to miss the rapture and then not get saved. In yep. fact, what I would do, I, I'd be very concerned about people hearing the gospel, especially people that I love and are close to me. I wouldn't want them to hear a thing. That's right. Because I, I, I'd want God to somehow bring them to salvation before the rapture, if possible, but I don't want them to hear about it because I wouldn't want them to reject and then go to hell after the rapture. No, I, I believe the opposite. I believe out of every tribe, nation, tongue, and people group, massive amounts of Gentiles are going to be saved according to Revelation chapter 17. S too many to number, meaning too many that we're going to be able to number here on earth. Massive amounts of salvations are going to take place. And I believe it's because of our faithful witness and leaving things behind like we were talking about earlier for Amen. them. Not just your beans and rice, but 
the truth of the hope of Jesus and salvation. One, I a couple quick thoughts on this too myself. You know, people get upset because, well, then they get a second chance. That's not fair. They get a second chance. Folks, every day on earth here, thousands of people get a second chance. Millions of them get a second, third, fourth chance. It, it doesn't matter that we've changed dispensations. It, that's completely beside the point. Here's, here's another interesting point. The Lord Jesus' flesh and blood brothers rejected the gospel under the Mosaic economy. And after they changed dispensations to the New Testament economy, guess what? They believed. They got a trans dispensation second chance. That's the biblical precedent. Uh, it, it is. And I, you think, well, praise God they get a second chance. Amen. I mean, I mean, wow. I mean, it, uh, my, my friends and close and, and family, I don't want them to go to hell. I tell them about Jesus now. And I don't want them to miss the rapture, but they may. So I'm hoping they get another chance. I mean, wow. When you get to Revelation chapter 14, all those who receive the mark, there is no other chance. That's that's game over at that point. I skipped a couple questions because we actually uh, went into them during our talk. So there's really only two left here now. Okay. Um do you think the two prophets are in the first half or the second half of the tribulation? First half. Okay. It's very clear because it, it numbers their days and it also tells them that they're killed when Antichrist appears. He kills them and the world sees them rise um, into heaven and then uh, they're gone. And then we have the bold judgments that take place after that. I believe they're preaching along with the 144,000, uh, but um, that's, that's my take. What do you think, Lee? Well, I actually am one of the few that put them in the second half, but it's too long of an explanation to go into right now. So um, I do have a couple videos on the subject if anyone is interested. Okay. Last question. What is the best way to tell people about Jesus and the coming end? So, <laughs> a good book, absolutely. Well, this, I mean, that's what I do in the book. I tell them, hey, this is what's coming, but I have the gospel in it. You know what I mean? The, the thing, when we look at Bible prophecy, um, the, we don't just, Lee and I don't just talk about these things just for entertainment. I mean, believe me, I I can find, I would go back to real estate, and it, it was good. it was good life, it was fun, you know, and I was saved while I did it in, in title insurance, thoroughly enjoyed it. My mind was challenged all the time doing title insurance. It was great. So I don't do this. We don't do this for entertainment. It's, it's, it's the warnings. Bible prophecy rightly understood is a warning. That's right. And, and, uh, and I tell people this all the time. John the Baptist, look it up, Gospel of Luke. What did he do? He warned of judgment. He warned of judgment for the general general population, a boy, he really went after the religious leaders, yep. but he warned of judgment to come. And then he also told them about mercy. Yes. Turn to God. That's what we do with Bible prophecy. Listen, Bible prophecy warns of judgment. We see everything coming together with the intention to get to people to the place of, but there's grace and there's hope in Jesus. You don't have to go through judgment. Jesus came the first time to forgive us of, forgive us of our sin. He's coming back the second time as a judge. Not going to be good. Not going to be good. But what hope we have in Jesus. Amen. Well, there was a few questions we didn't get to. I apologize. We really ran out of time. Uh, Tom actually gave us a half hour more than we had planned. So we thank you, Tom, for that. And Thanks, why Lee. don't you, Tom, just give us a very brief closing word of encouragement and then close us in prayer. Listen, everybody, our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us life. And remember this, if you're a believer in Christ, this world is as close as you're ever going to get to hell. So no matter what is going on, no matter wars and rumors of wars and tracking and all the other insane stuff that's taking place, the insane climate laws, and no matter how bad you're your own life gets, going through trial and, and difficulty and loss of loved ones, 
in Christ, you're going to be reunited with all those in Christ when this life is over. This world is as close as you're ever going to get to hell. And the reason why we see all these things that are going on right now and what these globalists are doing and all the insane stuff is because this is as close as they're ever getting to heaven. They are trying to shape their eternal, their 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 utopian kingdom right now because this is this is their heaven. That's why these things are happening. So with us, what do we do? We do what Jesus said. We look up, we lift up our head because our redemption draws near. Lift up our head is with expectant joy. So that's what we do. We say, hey, though all these other things are against me, the mocking and all these other things, difficulty, it's all right. This world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. And that, folks, is where we are going. And that is what keeps us going is the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for your, your ministry today. I thank you for Lee. What a blessing he is. What a great brother and encouraging. And we pray for your ministering to everybody out there that's tuning in now and later. Minister, grant them your peace and your joy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for showing up. I want to thank you, moderators, for all your tremendous help in the room. Everyone, keep pressing onwards, keep pressing upwards, and keep your eyes on the skies because Jesus is coming soon. See you all later. Bye, everybody.